Hi, this is Jay Cross. Yeah. I'm talking with Paul Pangaro. And we're in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Yeah. And Paul, over lunch, what, three days ago, I, I said, well, cybernetics. I, mean, I know you're an expert on cybernetics. What, what the hell is cybernetics and why should I care about cybernetics? Cyber what? <laughs> I think the first thing to say about the word cybernetics is it comes from the same root as the Greek word for steering, and specifically the art of steering. Now, when you steer, it's because you want to get somewhere and you kind of have an idea of where you want to go. And as you set out to get there, you're blown off course. You don't go straight, you have some backs and forths. So cybernetics involves the idea of using feedback from your action to comparing to your goal and saying, well, I want to go there, but I'm going there, so I've got a problem and I correct. And in fact, the word feedback comes from this activity in the middle of the 20th century by a bunch of extraordinary people, Gregory Bateson, Margaret Mead, John von Neumann, Norbert Wiener, Heinz von Forster, and others, philosophers and uh, linguists and other kinds of people, who said, hey, there's this thing that systems do, which is have a goal and try to get to the goal, and they use information to do that. Let's call that feedback. That's how the word feedback comes into the language. Now the reason why we should care is because intelligent systems, human beings that interact with their environment, have goals. And they use feedback to get to their goals. So cybernetics as a science of feedback, information, and goals is incredibly valuable in a number of different disciplines. Now, what you said sounds so natural and obvious. I know there's going to be a whole lot more to this story. Yeah. So continue on about how I do something with this okay. train of thought. Well, where the train of thought brought Ross Ashby was to the idea that systems have limits, don't they? So if I'm in the ship and I'm trying to get over there, if the wind is this strong, I can correct. If the wind is this strong, screw it, I can't correct. So he developed this idea of the law of requisite variety. Variety is the range of capabilities I have. Another classic example of a cybernetic system in the mechanical sense is a thermostat and a heater in a room. So in this room now, the heater's working just fine because it's not that cold out. But if it were way, way, way colder, then I couldn't bring the room to a comfortable temperature. So the variety of the system, the room with its uh, thermostat and its heater and so on, has a certain capacity or variety is the technical term. Now, requisite variety of a system is the ability to achieve the goals that we have for it. The more classic case of requisite variety is biological systems like human beings. There has to be requisite variety in my system now to keep my body temperature steady, to keep my glucose level steady, to keep a lot of things steady. And these are what Ashby called essential variables. And my body has the requisite variety to keep the essential variables in check to keep me alive within certain limits of where I am, if it's too cold or too hot, etc. Now, a reason why this is valuable, and using this with design students of all kinds, is to say, you can design that piece of software to do whatever you want, but the more variety the system has, the more features, the more capacity, the more range, the harder it is to build. So you don't get anything for free. So an awareness of the amount of variety you want to program into the software in this case is something that has trade-offs. To be aware of the trade-offs, the limitations of the system is absolutely phenomenally important. So it not only brings it to consciousness, but it gives you ways of uh, specifically applying metrics and then using those metrics to see where you want to make the trade-offs in design. You teach. Hmm? Where do you teach? I teach at the School of the Visual Arts in New York and also at Parsons, the new school. And I use these models of which first order feedback is one and requisite variety is two. There are five or six altogether for students to get a sense of two things. One is, as I just explained, the user has a goal and a range of capacity that the software, say, gives that user. So that's interesting. But the same processes, feedback, um, variety, uh, conversation is another model, uh, bio cost is another, which is the expense of 
uh, a user or a team involved in some process, and coevolution is another. These are models that apply not just to thinking about what the user's process is, but to thinking about what the design process is. The models are the same, and I'm looking at two very critical aspects of what design students do, which is they design with a user in mind, but they design a design process. And the same models work for both. Yeah, is, is this what the uh, sort of pop business press these days is calling design thinking, or is this something else? Design thinking, to me, in its kind of essence, has a couple of features. One is put designers at the beginning. Love it. Uh, be creative, don't just be analytical, which had come before design thinking. Great, love it. But from there, if you look at the processes of design thinking, it's, well, talk to users, observe, do ethnographic research. Love it. But then you brainstorm, and then you prototype, and then you iterate and evaluate. Well, as far as I can tell, these are not methodological steps. It's just stuff you do, and you do the best you can. What I would like to do to replace design thinking is to recognize that the law of requisite variety, for example, can be applied to the process of designing the prototype. It's one example of many. Isn't all of this conversation anyway? And aren't we conversing about goals and conversing about means to achieve the goals and conversing about the design process and making the design process better? Yes. So instead of design thinking, how about design conversations, or specifically designing for conversations? And just to take it that tiny step further, I am designing so that users can have better conversations. I'm designing for conversation. But I'm using these same cybernetic models to help designers understand the process of design, which is design as conversation. So that parallelism, design for, design as conversation, is unified by the same models. Now, you and I both use the word conversation mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I talk about it being as strong as learning technology there is. Mm -hmm. And I know you've said that in, in your work it, it's an obsession of yours. It is. Why does, what role does conversation have in this? I mean, bring that into this, the cybernetic sphere for me. Well, first of all, you can't learn without conversation. And even if I'm reading a book, I'm having a conversation with myself. I'm taking the point of view of the text and the point of view of where I started from and the point of view that I moved to and the point of view of the next paragraph of text. So learning is impossible without a conversation, either internal or external with you. So that's one aspect of the importance of conversation. Um, because learning involves conversation, my claim, as you've heard, is that if I can think about what the elements of conversation are, and you can simplify them to five, oversimplify them to five, then you can look at each one of those, and if you want to design for better conversation, you can improve each one. For example, the first one in my mind is context. So at what point do I interrupt and I say, hi, Jay, um, I've got a question, or Jay, would you like to learn about cybernetics, which you don't know about? Or in this case, you asked me. So that moment of context is, is perfect. It's the right, it's the right moment to, to start the conversation. Having initiated it, second is language. What language do I choose to start? If I start speaking the, the magic and obscure jargon of cybernetics, you won't understand because you don't know what it means. So the whole point would be to start with a common language. And we may have to evolve what that language is in time, but we have to start from a common shared, shared meaning. The third element is exchange, so there's a back and forth, which this isn't quite, you're asking me some questions, but uh, you know, back and forth and you say I don't get it or that's absurd or we, we have this exchange and I show you things, I show you how stuff works and so on and so forth, a series of exchanges, it's the middle. Then there's agreement, which is you say I understand what you're saying, or I say yes Jay, you understand me now, I can see that what you're doing is consistent with my understanding of cybernetics.